welcome on behalf of Berlinale Talent. So we wrapping up with 255 wonderful filmmakers today coming from uh, 86 countries. Amongst uh, these 255, we ha have also uh, directors uh, who are coming from the animation field in stop motion and uh, the puppets taking now over in this last session in How To. And uh, we are curious to hear also the humans behind uh, these nice guys, the mice and the wol wolfish guys and uh, the dogs from Isle of Dogs. Um, yeah, please welcome also Nikki von Lindrot von Bart and uh, Jay Clark, the storyboarder of, uh, from Isle of Dogs. And also please give a warm welcome to Andrew Emmonson. He is a, a cr creative uh, person since working since many, many years, also as director and producer. And he was a former member of our selection committee. So please enjoy the session here. Thank you, Thank you Christina. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Great that you're here today. Um, so just a, a little bit more of an introduction, both for Nikki and for Jay. Um, Nikki is a visual artist, uh, also working as a, a costume designer. He worked with David Bowie on Black Star, I saw. Um, and also as your work as a, as a director, working frame by frame to create these beautifully detailed and surreal worlds for your films. Um, the film we're going to watch in just a second is uh, it premiered here at the Berlinale in the Generation section. This competition, yes? Yeah, European premiere, yeah. European premiere, okay, yeah. great. Premiered in Toronto uh, last oh, September or something. Great, so we're going, to have a, we're going to have a chance to see the film in its entirety in just one second. Uh, her film before, The Burden, and there's others, but The Burden uh, went around the world to all the festivals, it snatched up 82 awards, including the Best International Short Film. 85. <laughs> oh, 80. We're up to 85 now. <laughs> okay, very good. I stand corrected. Well, that's, that's good. And Jay, we're really happy to have Jay back uh, to the Berlinale. He was here two years ago when, when Isle of Dogs was at the Berlinale. And uh, Jay's worked with some really, uh, you know, the greatest stop motion directors. Uh, you know, we're talking about Nick, uh, Nick Park, Ardman Entertainment, you know, on his characters like Wallace and Gromit and Shaun the Sheep. And uh, Jay is a, a close collaborator when it comes to the storyboard and pre-visualization process for Wes's films. And the first one was uh, Grand Budapest, Grand Budapest Hotel, Isle of Dogs, and uh, the forthcoming film from Wes, which is The French Dispatch. We're all looking forward to that. So we'll get into conversation. Uh, the way it'll work is there'll be time afterwards for your questions, but we're gonna a little bit march through the production process, the pre-production, looking at, looking at the frame and how we bring these frames together. So, well, without any much more talking on this side, let's watch Something to Remember from Nikki Lindro von Ba. Wow, it's it's a really it's a beautiful film, and I, it gets better every time I see it. Okay. How how has the how has the reaction been since showing it here? I think it was good. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's always hard to tell, you know. But but I think uh, this is a very short film. I mean, to be I mean, my previous films has been more like I don't know, eleven, fourteen minutes. Uh, but I sort of so I I felt that the like. The short format may be like a bit too short in, in a program, but actually I was quite uh, relieved that it was so short in, in this program that I'm in, because like the other films were quite long, and then mm -hmm. it's quite nice to have something that's just like, oh, now it's over. And I, <laughs> did I like it? I don't know, <laughs> but it's, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I know, that's, I know that's true from programming, that uh, if you have a short film that's under five or mm. around five, it's much easier to program than these longer ones, so it, it can fit in to a program quite nicely. Yeah, hopefully, or it will just disappear. It's like, it's a really, yeah. uh, it's a fine line, I think, mm. when, when programming, but I was really happy about this, this mm. program here. Great. Well, what's, what strikes me about it is the framing, and I want to talk about both of your uh, references and inspirations when it comes to framing because that's, that's something that connects you and it connects all of us here. I just, and then real quick, I want to ask how many animators are in the audience tonight? Yeah, okay, a good number. And in working in stop motion? 
Hi, look at that. That's good. We could probably make a film, I think. <laughs> yeah. We, we, got, we got the puppets, we, the we got the it's people. Good. It's more than I've like, ever seen in one place before. It's really... <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, and I think, I mean, even if you're... Even if you're not working frame by frame, what is important is the frame. And, and I wanted to get into, we can talk about a few of the inspirations that generally inspire your work. And then Jay has prepared a presentation of his work on uh, bringing together the references that Wes Anderson had in mind for Isle of Dogs. And then we'll go into that as the pre-visualization. But um, tell us, you can click through here and tell us a little bit about what right. inspires you for your framing. Yeah, so I, I chose uh, my most, uh, um, the, the, the artist that I sort of uh, love the most, it's Caspar David Friedrich, uh, who's like not mer very like, maybe not very modern, <laughs> but I do like, I, I don't know if that's like visible in my films, maybe it's not visible at all, uh, ever, but like before starting up with a new project, I always, uh, look in, in my book with his, uh, with his paintings because I think it's like, uh, I, I do think he's so great with the framing and I also feel that he's, uh, like the humans in his uh, uh, pictures are like so subtle and also like almost uh, always turned away from the, from the image, which I also enjoy so much. I think like uh, just, with my Im with my um, uh, films in general, I I sort of I, I'm not very like character driven at all. I I'd see my sort of like the atmosphere or the surroundings uh, or the like yeah the the places uh, as sort of the main character and and my my puppets are more just sort of exposed to a situation or to life or whatever. It's not that I sit down and really think about what they, like, what kind of person is this mouse or whatever. It's just like, yeah, they're sort of um, visitors in this atmosphere. Um, so yeah, so when it comes to framing, I, I love this sort of, that, that, that the landscape and the, um, and also like the atmospheres. I, I love the atmospheres in his, um, in his paintings. Um, also, I very often come back to this, actually this is a, a clip from um, uh, Mulholland Drive by David Lynch, and it's like uh, in a coffee shop where uh, someone um, meets with his friend and um, he tells this, uh, he tells him about a dream that he had, that it's, that, and that dream was exactly like this, uh, situation that they're in now, like that, that they're sitting by this table at this coffee shop and then they go out and then something horrible happens and then they do this uh, for real. Um, so they go out and go to the back and then there's this uh, like horrible person, <laughs> the horrible homeless man, <laughs> I don't know, uh, which is just sort of a, like a little bit of a jump scare. Uh, but I just think that that scene, I just love that atmosphere so much. And I also sort of copied a little bit of that atmosphere into The Burden, where, where, where it's like uh, a dog working in a, in a supermarket that sort of retells his dream as if it were uh, real life. And you sort of don't really know what's real life or not. Uh, yeah, something like that. And yeah, sorry, and also this uh, just like, a, very short, this is uh, Henry Darger, uh, who, who was um, um, an artist, or like he, he was just, um, uh, he just painted um, uh, a lot, like he just created like an entire world of, of tiny girls fighting uh, like a weird regime or like, mili like military uh, guys and, and sort of, um, so it was like some sort of weird fantasy uh, uh, tale that never really ended. Uh, yeah, and it's quite horrible sometimes, <laughs> but also really like just in the details and the framing, I think it's interesting as well. Yeah, and then, and then the next slide shows you the steps through into your choice of framing from this film. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, so um, uh, this is also just like a couple of uh, images that I would like to show you as like that you can see like from a reference to like the work in progress to the actual uh, scene. Um, and I work like, as you probably understand, I work a lot with like real, uh, like real images and real 
places. So I document, for example, this sort of doctor's office, like a, a real, very like Swedish um, uh, terrible doctor's office. Uh, and uh, yeah, I like take pictures and then uh, we sort of build in front of the camera. This is Niklas, my co-set co designer. Uh, you, may, you might remember this, uh, or like you, you uh, recognize this puppet from here. Uh, this was actually like a much older puppet. We just used this puppet as a like, symbol for another puppet. Uh, so like we, we build, like we sketch a lot in front of the camera because that's all it is about really. Uh, and this is sort of uh, almost done. And uh, this is the final, uh, final scene. Um, also, yeah, that was... Yeah, I guess, I yeah. Think that's, yeah, that's it. And if we can switch over to the other input for uh, Jay's laptop. That's your cue, Jay. Well, so. first of all, I just said that's a really beautiful film. That's the first time I've seen it. I deliberately Thank didn't you. want to see it until tonight. <laughs> so um, it's really good to be back. Thanks, Andrew. Um, nothing's changed in Berlin, and, and that's a good thing. But um, so really, when you you know when I came originally, when Isle of Dogs first premiered, I think the talk was much more sort of expansive and covered quite a lot of ground, but um, what I found interesting when we were catching up is this idea of really digging down into Kurosawa. So that's my portion of, um, of tonight, is to really sort of, you know, when Wes first got in touch about Isle of Dogs, he said that Kurosawa was, was going to be the real, you know, driving influence, but um, specifically early Kurosawa because everyone's sort of aware of those, the Seven Samurai and, and the more, the later films. But there's this whole sort of back history of Kurosawa, which we were able to just jump into and um, really spend time with a master of cinema. So that's my plan. We will spend time with a master of cinema and I'll somehow show you how that fed into Isle of Dogs. Um, first off uh, was this idea it's crazy to think this was back in 2017, but the, the, one of the main influences were Japanese woodblock prints. Wes said if, if somehow the animatic and the storyboards could, could look like Japanese woodblock prints. So I went to the VNA and really studied the line work and um, just the characters and the settings. And already I could see if this is gonna be this world with the world of stop motion, I could, you could kind of get an idea of what the this weird fusion was going to be. Um, so, and they're, they're, they're inherently cinematic anyway. They're kind of almost like camera moves, you know, the way the eye is drawn down to that whirlpool of activity. And I was struck by the fact that, you know, Wes Anderson is very much known for how he moves the camera in a particular way. And so comparing that, the Japanese woodblock prints with how he moves the camera so these are a few examples of, of storyboards of how you, you begin in one area and you move the camera to give the audience some more information. And, you're, and just real quick, you're, you're drawing these, these, these full boards so that the, you can send them to the editor who's going to do the camera moves for the animatic, yeah? That's right, the editor um, is a chap, we've worked together on all three projects now, starting with Grand Budapest and uh, he's called Edward Bursch. And he's a sort of After Effects genius. Um, somehow we're able to supply him with these, uh, with this artwork and with the animation poses, and he starts to edit this thing, and and it slowly builds from there. Um, so again, with the Japanese woodblock prints, you can see the almost camera moving left and right. Um, so that was fun, and I include these really just as a, as an example of say how you can take the subject matter of your film and somehow start to Im impose it on the the actual work and that, that that will somehow let you get closer to that zeitgeist of, um, in this instance, you know, Japanese cinema. Um, and, how did, and how did it work when you were, when, was it a back and forth with Wes a little bit, you know? You, oh yeah, a lot of back and forth. Yeah, okay. And so <laughs> For it, sure. you, you bring him something, you talk about something. And what, were the, what were the things that floated to the top for you? Well, he, his scripts are very um, detailed and prepared and almost like a little novel. And so the procedure that, that we go through because I was on Isle of Dogs for two years, so that's, you know, the film only lasts for, um, I'm not even sure, but it doesn't last for two years. <laughs> but what we do over that process is we make, um, you know, quite a lot, a few versions of the film, and you're always trying to find the best version of a shot, of a scene. 
And so that's where the time is spent. And when Wes, Wes has time, he's able to thumbnail. Um, when he doesn't, there's shot lists that, you know, that I, I then sketch up and he reacts to. And you, know, you just sort of go from there, really. Um, and Nikki, just on, for you as well, in this, in this process, like how much time are you putting into this mapping them out? With the, you do your own storyboards, or yeah. have up to this point? Yeah, until now. Uh, I'm actually just starting out to, to work with the storyboard team uh, next week, so I'm uh, very scared Give them help. and excited. <laughs> Jay, do you, have any, do you have any tips for how to yeah. talk with storyboard artists, how to get the most yeah. out of your storyboard artists? <laughs> Respecto. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Uh, no, but I've been <laughs> no, but I've been doing my own storyboarding, and I think uh, this will actually be quite a big leap for me since I uh, I do think a lot visually. When like to me, just writing a script in uh, just text it doesn't really say that much to me. Uh, so so it's it's very important to me to sort of like like uh, draw whatever I'm thinking and just like seeing these images of, of this uh, scene, uh, of, like, yeah, in front of me. So, um, so I'm not, I, I, yeah, I think it will be, uh, uh, it will be an interesting experience uh, to collaborate uh, with someone else. Um, but also like, I don't know, I, I wouldn't really be able to uh, use I, you will see a couple of, of the drawings from my own storyboards later on, and, and those are quite like it's. I wouldn't want to give that to someone else to sort of make a film out of because that's just like it it's, makes sense for me, but it's still just like childish drawings. So yeah. I think this would be this will be good. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm, we're not seeing it here, but I remember from before that Wes, in his detailed descriptions, also had his own little thumbnails, you know, so. Yeah, he's always, he's always done, going all the way back to Rushmore, I think he's, he's always thumbnailed on the script, and that's a very sort of, he, he's, I guess he's of that school of filmmakers, the, the Hitchcocks, the, the Spielbergs, and the Kurosawas that, um, that did use that tool as a way to, like you said, communicate mm -hmm. ideas, really. Um, you know, which brings us nicely into Kurosawa because he, he, he storyboarded and um, he had storyboarders and it was really a way of, um, you know, getting to some of those images that, it's like I was saying to Andrew, some of these Kurosawa films have lasted generations and some of these images, is, you know, the fact that we're still talking about them tonight, um, is, is, is interesting that his process, you know, began with sketching and I think he wanted to be a painter when he was younger. So um, what I have here is um, a few examples of, let me see. This is an early film called uh, The Men Who Tread on the Tiger's Tail. And um, I'll just play a little clip and then I'll talk about how it, how it kind of fed into the frame. He sort of constructs a lot of these shots. So this is a sort of example from a shot from Isle of Dogs where you have that very extreme um, foreground layering. Um, with the detail and what's interesting it, it really starts to make you think about the depth of the shot um, mm. yeah. And I always think any time you, you can storyboard and, and almost want to climb into the storyboard in a way and get in there and go Find out what's that what's going on in that robot dog's head, but you, you really want to sort of draw the audience um, Audience in so again another example of, of this sort of extre extreme layering that we brought in but yeah, as I mentioned, Kurosawa did his own storyboards and in fact did a lot of them with color. Um, and this is a quote, uh, him explaining it was a way to, for him to clearly grasp the visual image that he was after. Um, this next clip is a, a, a brief little montage of a few of his storyboards kind of intercut with um, the finish shot. Storyboard is interesting because it, it brings us onto this idea of how you would use nature in the, um, in the shot. He would often do this because there wouldn't be very much going on in the, in, the ca in the actual shot itself. The character would be very still. And he would use like wind and, and sounds and um, you know, the grass and the trees would blow. And it was a way of sort of introducing movement into a static frame. So um, I have a few examples of that. And uh, Yeah, yeah. I do. Uh, that sort of interests me a lot. But I'm, I'm very like into this sort of anti-aesthetic sort of uh, environment uh, and I think it's like I think it's about really uh, finding these environments that sort of bugs me a bit or like that that I feel like that I feel is like unpleasant for example in the bird and my my uh, previous film before this one 
uh, it's enacted in, in this sort of like huge sort of mall or whatever that you can find beside a, a, any highway in sort of Western, the Western world. Like it's just like different kinds of, um, you know, like um, uh, a hamburger restaurant and like a, a, a cheap hotel and uh, some sort of like supermarket and everything is just like being tossed out in nature and, and like it's just like a lonely satellite somehow and, and I just felt so like yeah, it's just felt so unpleasant and so like generic to me too, because like everything is just about this sort of like consuming, uh, like d driving and consuming and nothing else, you know. Um, but I, uh, so I think it's a somewhat as a therapy to me to sort of like, you know, re like make all of this again in uh, in um, uh, in a miniature, which I like. I, I do that a lot myself, uh, and also this. Um, uh, this doctor's office, for example, I was quite, uh, when I was pregnant, I became, became quite ill with some chronic stuff that stuck with me. So I've been sort of visiting the doctor's office like for so many times now uh, from never doing that like at all. And that's also like, I guess that's real like a therapy for me to just like, I'm gonna build this <laughs> and everything will be good. And I will, you know, you, you sort of just choose this sort of like, uh, sad and boring places and you put like a lot of love into the the remake and I think it just something maybe happens I don't know so we can Andrew we can talk a little bit about um, the blocking of characters and stuff and we there's a few things I can move through quite quickly and then maybe if there's questions at the end we can always circle back to right, right okay. but um, the one thing that we, you know, that I did do is watch a lot of um, films such as The Bad Sleep World, and if you guys have seen that, and the way that um, I often work is that if I can and if I have the time, is you know, really study, look at these films, look at scenes. Um, in this particular case, look at how Kurosawa was dealing with large groups of characters in shot, because it's very easy for a, for a shot to suddenly become quite messy and disorganized, and that wasn't the way that Kurosawa worked. You know, he worked in a very sort of specific way. Um, so it's, it's interesting to sort of look at how he stages large groups, and the same that, way that Wes approaches it is that it's very choreographed and um, everybody hits their mark. Um, the clip I want to show you is, um, I have my notes here, is from, from the bad sleep well. And it's just a kind of series of fixed shots. Most of it is played out in this wide. And really the way that the characters interact and move around the frame is Kurosawa's way of telling the audience what's going on, really, um, in the story, but also in the psychology of the characters. And um, so I just want to play that clip and just sort of let you guys appreciate how the characters are moving around. And I'll, I'll chip in with a few thoughts on well, uh, then let's, let's um, get into some of the production uh, moments from The Burden, uh, so we can talk more about sure. the production process with you. Mm -hmm. So if we can switch to the... Oh, is it? Yeah, it's me again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, uh, Daniel, can we switch to oh, the, yeah. the clip off of the laptop, not on the laptop, but the other one? Uh, whatever's next from the system. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so just not just, but like, uh, can you please like make a dance for me? Uh, we don't know each other, and I have no money, but uh, <laughs> please, <laughs> you know. Uh, and she was so kind to do that, mm. and she recorded this with her um, um, with her phone, and then uh, Eric used this. Um, uh, this uh, uh, footage as some sort of reference when he was uh, animating. And that scene, you will see that later on, and I think it took, like, it is like just one minute of tap dancing, but that took, I think, over eight weeks to animate. It was like wow. absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> also that set was uh, sort of built uh, out of wood, and it was uh, located in this kind of very tiny basement um, room, which since like time passed, uh, and it was sort of like, 
autumn winter so like it, it became you know it froze outside and then it became warmer so like the the entire set was sort of just like uh, uh, you know like uh, because of the the wood it yeah. sort of was swollen and then went back so like afterward i think it was like a horrible uh, thing for for post-production to sort of just like take move, move remove the, the rigs set. and yeah. stuff like that yeah <laughs> because it's like you know, because it's also like um, I, I, I work like that a lot with, with um, like static cameras with like very long uh, takes. Uh, so this is one and a half minute and also the, the fish scene in that film is like over two minutes. And uh, that's really not a good idea, but, but I, I love the style of it. Um, yeah. I, I, that's something I did appreciate. I do appreciate about the films I've seen from you is this this generosity of space and the minimal yeah. movement so that all of a sudden you really become hyper-focused on what's happening. Yeah. I mean, of course, we will see a tap dancing scene, but yes. some of the other scenes where, like the doctor's office, just yeah. then you're just really watching the little slug tentacles. You know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, like for, for this film that we just saw, I think that was especially because when I, I really had this in mind that I just wanted these very precise uh, pictures for, for you to watch for like, you know, a minute or so uh, and nothing really happening, just like someone singing and that was like really hard to, even for me who's like, I like this slow pace but it, even for me it was hard to sort of like will this really work? Because like nothing is really happening, but I think it works quite well actually uh, and also you spoke about depth in the pictures and I think that's like when working with stop motion animation is just so rewarding to work with that because that's it's so much easier uh, compared to working with like 2d animation uh that like if you have something close or something further back it like the 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 picture will be automatically so interesting to watch for a long time so so i'm thinking about my my um uh, my framing as like yeah as paintings maybe or as something that you that's okay to watch for a longer time um so, yeah, this so is, you had the yeah. reference of the tap dancing and then you're using that as you're animating throughout. Do we have the clip next? Yes, I yeah. think it's next. So this is just uh, from my, my personal storyboard, which that make, it's like cute, but it makes no sense. Uh, and yeah, this is just Eric uh, who was um, animating this, this scene. You can see sort of like the scale uh, and how, how it's done. <laughs> Thank you. So that was actually, I mean, it, it was, uh, <laughs> that was just so like so horrible in so many ways but also like since I had so little money for making this film I also uh, felt that I had no money for making like real professional armatures like skeletons for the puppets uh, so I used like the same technique that I usually do like you know just making them myself with like uh, aluminum wire and, and these things. And I was just so like sure of myself, like they never break, they never break. Like, but what what if they break? No, 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 that's not a problem. They never do. But this actually sort of broke down a couple of times <laughs> during the shoot, and there were just like some quite you know heavy um, you know like surgery going on <laughs> in between the <laughs> frames. But uh, yeah, so I'm sorry about that uh, <laughs> to Eric. <laughs> yeah. And I'd, I'd, I'd heard you say before, maybe about this film, that uh, one of the big influences for you were the old Hollywood musical and yeah. Busby Berkeley, and yeah. and so I think we, that's the last clip. Do we have what's what's up next? I mean, I remember? Let's hmm? see. Let's see if we press a button, see what happens. Ah, yeah, this is also just um, uh, my own storyboarding, basically. But I, I do. I mean, it's not. I mean, it's not always the exact. Um, picture that will that you will get finally because then I go from using these images and like to to sort of start building in front of the camera and then things might be a little bit different but it's still uh, I think for me when when just sort of uh, drawing these things it sort of helps me think a lot uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it very hard to just sort of write this down. Um, and so now we'll see the, the, the clip from the actual film and then go straight into um, the uh, behind the scenes. Uh, right. Yeah? Yes. Uh, and yeah. This. So it set up this scene that we're going to also see. This is yeah. we're talking about Busby Berkeley and. Yes. So this is, uh, this is Johanna uh, who's uh, uh, animating uh, one scene from the, uh, the office with the, the sort of call center monkeys are working. And these have, like, these monkeys has. Um, 
um, uh, like movable mouths or like changeable mouths. So all of these mouths are sort of like like out there <laughs> lying around. <laughs> I think she has some sort of uh, logic to it, but <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> so that was like a new thing for me, which was quite fun to use these mouths. Um, and then also we have we have. Um a live recording for some of the music that you prepared for this exactly. scene. Exactly. So, yeah. So maybe that is the next one. Uh, so we really wanted to keep this, uh, like, very uh, authentic, uh, old-school musical style by, by having this live orchestra, which I think it's working really well, actually. You know what I love about these, these clips is that they, they have these, you know, the big number, and then this is really awkward to pause, <laughs> this yeah, awkward yeah, time yeah. afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Also this, like, I can just say very briefly that this, this scene, uh, Johanna was working on that scene and uh, I wasn't there that day, but like, th this, like this was sort of a camera movement that went on for like backwards for like several days, which is not really good to work with this sort of slider to sort of like leave it overnight because things tend to happen all the time. And uh, so she called me like in the morning and just like, yeah, so like she was sort of like had been working for like four days with this scene and then the camera was like maybe like somewhere uh, in the middle of this uh, slide. And then when she sort of like started it up again, the like the, the camera was just like all of a sudden just like moving like eh, and just like in like hitting the like the start uh, like point just like doom 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 <laughs> so like the, the entire like you know you lost the image like totally it was like all messed up but somehow she could sort of like uh, find her way back again but that was like the weirdest thing ever uh, so yeah that can happen <laughs> well great I think we've made thought it animation could be so stressful <laughs> exactly. It it's so cute and fun, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's worth it. Yeah. Well, we have it. We, we're doing okay. I was worried about time, but now we're doing okay. We still have time for questions and everything. Um, but the two things that would be nice to do: we have the puppets here, we have the camera here, and you've done some nice work in in your presentation also about character, the development of character that you also, in your work as a storyboard with Wes, helping develop the characters. You know, so from an early stage. Sure. I mean, if we can get back to some images. Oh yeah, can uh, we go back the laptop, to the laptop? Super. Um, so I can I can talk about that in terms of, of the movement of the camera because mm -hmm. it's really the characters that should dictate that. You know, but you shouldn't just kind of um, move the camera willy nilly. It should be somehow tied into the, the sort of emotions of the character. So one shot I remember um, really being quite fond of is the the birth of the puppies towards the end of the film. And again, sort of tying it back to Kurosawa, and, and it's interesting, Nikki, that you're always, you're quite limited with your cuts, aren't you? You often do long takes, very long takes, in yeah. fact. And it's a very sort of, um, you know, a great, fantastic old Hollywood tradition, and, and Kurosawa was very much a believer in that, that every shot, in a way, should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, um, and that it's, you know, telling a story. So. Um, yeah, as you say, Andrew, a lot of the character designs are sort of they, they're beginning, but they're not quite there, and, and the animatic is also beginning, so sometimes you have a period of time where you're just sketching what the characters might be, and you have that feedback from Wes, and he decides and evolves, and you know maybe take that nose from that dog and put it on that you know, character and stuff. But um, so here we see the birth of the puppy, and we see Atari coming in. So the beginning of the shot is really all about the puppies. And then you have the middle, which is much more about Atari and the caring side of his nature. And again, that kind of interaction between Spots and Atari. And then you have um, the section of the shot where the curtains start to blow in the wind and you reveal in the deep, deep, deep background um, chief at the tiller of the ship and then these are storyboards in order to be able to get us to that point of moving the camera through past Atari and chief um, and so as I say developing all the the, the sea and the stars and um, all the different dogs and just putting all this mixture together that Wes wants into this big soup um, and making these camera moves but but I did think that for me was a real, it's always a, and again, this is a learning process, you're always learning, but that whole idea of a short having a beginning, a middle, and an end, and somehow having, helping the transition to the next shot. 
um, I just find fascinating. So That's I'll just really play that clip. And then finally, I hope by now you've spotted the, the key word in all of these elements of movement and, and, and just the fact that, um, you know, they call them motion pictures for a reason. And, you know, that that is the thing that we sort of took away from Kurosawa, myself especially, is this, this sense of mov movement and motion. So um, this final point is just to to really discuss the idea that you can have movement in the cut. And as you all know, this idea of cutting on the action of something in a wide, and then cutting in close on the same action just helps make a, an invisible cut. And um, I always think that every time you make that cut, you're asking the audience to make a big leap with you. And so if you can help them on that journey, even the word cut is very violent. Yeah. So um, it, it's fun to see how Kurosad does that. And I'll play this final clip and then that's, that's me all done. Yeah, he's pretty annoyed. Um, I think he's a storyboarder and he's been asked to reboard it. Um, so yes, this just to tie that back into Isle of Dogs, there's a scene at the beginning where Chief is introducing all the, the pack and there's this very rapid cut through all the different dog tags. And um, so yeah, this is, this is a very fascinating thing that you can build that tempo in a film. Uh, you can have calm moments and then you can have very, very tense, tense moments. Do you have, a, you have the, a clip for this as well, the one from the film? I don't think I do, uh, but I have okay. an, a, a final piece of animatic that kind of sums up all of these, these points together. Mm -hmm. um, it's the scene in the causeway when uh, Atari's getting attacked by the robot dogs. So I'm, I'm happy to play that. And that's got, this is a demonstration of um, working with the editor to get the whole scene up and running. And it's, uh, it's pretty close to the final cut of the film, I think. So... Um, yeah, they <laughs> save a lot of money. No, of course, of course they need. <laughs> this is really amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, figuring out the timing. It's, it's this uh, gives Wes this opportunity to really figure out exactly. I mean, and I think this. I think maybe you'd said this before. He had learned a lot of lessons on Fantastic Mr. Fox, and and, and so he stepped up his storyboarding and the animatics for. Uh, for Isle of Dogs, is that right? Yeah, they used it on Grand Budapest, which, I mean, you do storyboarding live action, but it's rare that you make animatics. Um, and French Dispatch, which is out in a few months' time, there's a whole animatic for that. And that's just his procedure, that it's his chance to, to really sort of design the film in his own head um, before you get the pressures, as I'm sure you know, Nikki, of, of reality and budgets and, and teams of people and stuff. No. I wanted to see if we could get up and take a look at your puppets. We have the, they have them on the camera, and I know, Jay, you also have a few things about character, but uh, let's see. Let's move back to the, the server or wherever the, these images are. We have a few JPEGs to look at. Oh, yeah. Okay, should I move at the same time? No, no, we can talk about this first and then... Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so this is just... Uh, um, this is one of the um, mice or the rats or whatever from um, um, from the tap dancing uh, scene. So this is the the head that I sculpt in uh, in clay, and I make molds. And I uh, um, let me see what comes next here. Yeah. So this is like uh, this is the never breaking. It never breaks. <laughs> <laughs> How can you can you imagine? It never breaks. No. So yeah. So these are sort of the the very. Um, poor man's uh, uh, armature that I make myself. And um, I made these heads then out of um, uh, silicon. Um, yeah, and I usually work with like, uh, oh yeah, sorry, I go back. Uh, I usually work with a scale. I work with a quite specific scale. It's like, seven, like one to seven and a half uh, for some reason, uh, which is quite small, I think, but, but it's still, since I've been having like such a tiny studio, uh, I want to sort of like make the, the sets as uh, small as possible, but still keep the sort of amount of details in the, um, in the puppets and sets. So I think that works somehow for me. Uh, so these are sort of like Barbie size, like 23 centimeters, something like that. And this was like the first time actually where I tried to, since there are these monkeys in, in the, in the uh, call center uh, scene uh, that, that look sort of similar and they are like eight, pup, uh, like eight puppets and they have this sort of exchangeable mouse. Uh, 
so I just realized that I can't really do this by hand because it's too small. So I sculpted that head uh, and I took it into this sort of like ZBrush program. <laughs> I still don't know anything about it. I don't know how I did this, uh, <laughs> but uh, it worked okay. And then you could sort of like change this mouse into like 12 different mouths uh, in, within this program and then you sort of just printed this out or just, it took some time, but it okay. was still easy. Um, so then, but then of course you need to sort of like uh, hand paint everything uh, and put some fur on it. Uh, these are the sort of almost done puppets. Uh, so I use sort of tiny magnets to make them fit together. Uh, and then I put the, the, um, uh, the eyes in from like from the inside uh, to sort of have the eyes moving. Um, and yeah. So that's that, and um, yeah. Great. Jay, was there anything else you wanted to add about character or no? Well, again, just it, it does tie back into the, um, the fact that Wes would, you know, he would say maybe you make the mayor of um, Isle of Dogs look like Toshiro Mifuni. Um, so again, I have some images of that if we can get back to the laptop. Um, and again, just sort of drawing in the woodblock prints for Mid Mid Jomo, just generally thinking about that kind of Japanese heritage and and such wonderful artistry, like the the little Japanese models that they um, that are absolutely gorgeous and things. And yeah, I just found that quite exciting and fascinating. It's almost like actors that no longer are around can come back to life um, and be in films once again. And with the dogs, again, bringing in the Japanese woodblock influence, but at certain points, Wes would know which actors, you know, he cast and were going to play the part. So there's a little bit of Brian Cranston in, the, in there somewhere, um, which is always, again, quite fun to sort of find the, the, um, the character of the actor and put it into the, the actual puppet itself. So, yeah. Nice. So uh, what, can we, what can we do with your puppets? What do your puppets do? I mean, I know we're not going to make an animated film at this moment. We don't have the, no. the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. And these are also quite old. Should mm -hmm. I? Yeah. Uh, I'm moving towards the puppets. I, I feel, for some reason, I feel so embarrassed by having, it's like, you feel like a sort of like old toy lady or something, but uh, <laughs> it's just something else when they're not like on, mm. on set. <laughs> right. You know, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, like, it's, I, I will try to move something without anything falling down, but, like, when, when I was animating this, you could sort of, like, move the ears a little bit, and you sort of move the, the head, uh, and, of course, if you have, like, um, a needle, you could also move the, the eyes uh, right in the pu pupil. Ah, and, okay, uh, so you're just sticking right in the middle and just move Yeah, exactly. The, okay. I don't think I can do it with my, with my hands, but, uh, or actually, maybe I have... I can maybe, sorry, I can maybe remove one of, I have a needle here actually. So we'll see if this works, sorry. So you do like this, and then we'll probably have some sort of weird look to it now. Yeah, you don't see it anyway, <laughs> but it moved a little bit. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I mean like, these are like now very old uh, and not That's used. so in a trendy while. though, like the, the fashion is like... I know. Are you, are you a frustrated <laughs> fashion designer? No, but I do think it's like, that's actually like super important to me because I do feel that it's so... Uh, I make these costumes myself and I, I think it's so easy when you like, when you have a puppet uh, that is just like, it just become like a puppet with a... Uh, I don't know, a sweater and pants. Like it can becomes like puppets outfits. Uh, so I really try to, to study, you know, real clothing very, very carefully and like real brands. And I usually like have keep the brands in my, um, in my films. I hope that's fine. <laughs> uh, I don't really know, but um, I think that's super, because like, since I work with animals, I mean like, and so I think like, and also I, I try to keep them quite like genderless as well. So the, the outfits are like, that's all they have really. So I think it's about like, for these characters to sort of like, tell us who they are and we, and but also it's a bit fun that like, you know, that goes for humans too, it's like, we. We're just really like animals who try to sort of like 
dress up to like make certain impressions and stuff like that. So I, I thought it's funny. Have, have you ever have you ever used uh, human characters, or it's it's always no. been animals? And can you tell me your choice in in that? No, I never I never use humans. I think it's I never really found a way in to like designing human puppets that felt good to me it, it, it always become I think it becomes a little bit much about identification uh, and I'm not I'm not really interested in like that it should be this certain kind of person it's more about like as I said before I think it's more just about being able to identify yourself with everyone uh, to some extent and just like finding yourself in a weird you know situation or or uh, things like that, and also I, I just feel that it's a bit fun to think of my own films like some sort of like modern fables. That it's also a matter of like in the in the old days, like the traditional fables were much were very much about like having sort of like semi hidden uh, political messages and stuff like that, uh, hidden in the sort of children's uh, stories. Uh, and I think it's like a bit fun for me to work like you know, play around with that idea as well, to sort of like have very dark layers within this sort of like cute, cuteness filter or whatever. Yeah. That's great. Have you seen, I saw Pinocchio last night. Have you guys seen that yet? Is it out? It's out. Well, they screened it last night. I was traumatized. But, not the, not but again, you talk about that, the old fables and, and the sort of yeah, yeah, the yeah. dark layers of complexity. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But not the girl good. Go the Toro one. The, Sorry? The, the, the gear of the Toro is he's doing the stop motion Pinocchio, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So that was well, maybe that. <laughs> I, I, maybe I shouldn't even say that. Oh. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> um, yeah, well, but th yeah, that's a, that's a weird story for sure. Uh. <laughs> nah. Well, uh, we have you have one more little clip you can share. This is the work you've been doing, um, and then yeah. we can open it up to questions right after we see that. Okay. This is um, a trailer from. Oh. Yep. So this is my my last image of Isla Dogs, just saying good night as the as the as the moon rises. But yeah, French Dispatch is the next project um, that I was involved with, and that comes out in a few months' time. And you know, again, a very similar procedure, but this time jumping into the world of French cinema. And uh, so um, exactly the same sort of process. You know, that heritage and history that they've got the the Jean Luc Godards and the mm. Renoirs and the you know, so and was there just real quick, like in Grand Budapest, were there certain s uh, segments that were done in stop motion? I mean, were they doing there model. Are, uh, there are a few um, things in there that, that mm -hmm. are models, and, and ah, okay. I don't want to give too much away. Yeah. Plus, I'm probably legally bound not to. <laughs> but, but I can play you the trailer for you. For some of you, you may have already seen it, but um, again, just worth watching. How it seems like every time. Wes brings out a new live action, they're almost becoming almost like animated films. Um, so, you know, perhaps that the, that's the animatic process uh, that's, that's doing that. So I'll play the trailer. Well, great work on both sides. Do we have, do we have a microphone down here for, okay, there's a microphone we can pass around and I see a question right here. Hi, I have a question regarding working with Wes Anderson, and uh, I'm here. Yes, yeah, I'm a director by myself, and uh, talking about the uh, storyboards because I was really amazed by animatics and how precise they are. So, can you tell me more? How is like your connection in the creative pr uh, process? Do you decide together on the motion and how the frame will work? Because his whole cinematography is really, really you know, influenced by cinematographers. So. Could you tell like your experience, how you work together, like in the creative process? Mm. Work, working with Wes specifically? Yeah. No, yeah. It, it's Wes's vision, Wes's project. Wes drives it. Um, obviously, works on the script in, in in much detail. And in the first film, Grand Budapest uh, had been able to spend a lot of time, you know, thumbnailing. So it was really just helping take those thumbnails, make them much more detailed and animated. Um, and then through Isle of Dogs, obviously that was a longer project, much more animatic was needed. 
And so when he couldn't thumbnail, then I would thumbnail and then suggest he would react. Um, quite often what he does is takes a bit of an image and moves it around and uh, move that there. And so it's very sort of back and forth. But uh, really, you know, he's, he, he wants you to contribute, certainly, as all the members of the team. You're not just supposed to sit there passive. You're supposed to help and contribute and, and make the process work smoothly. But it's certainly Wes's vision. I'm, I'm there to help that onto paper and into the edit. Um, and so you certainly can make suggestions, but he's, he's the boss. Uh, yeah, but uh, on the Isle of Dogs, you showed like the f uh, storyboard and it had like a painting, a whole painting. So you do the painting or Wes is more responsible, like he says what's in the world or you just suggest and create it. Like the whole, you know, camera work, you can, you can see the frame just only part of it. So yeah. So Wes always also creates the worlds by itself, like all the details? Well, he has, I mean, again, it's really, it's, he's exploring. That's what the whole, you know, we don't make these animatics sort of for the sake of it. It's, it's a process that he's exploring. You have the production designer who's involved. He's starting a whole area of, um, of development and research and it's all feeding in to the storyboard. And I believe every shot, the way he works now is every shot that we animate and uh, make an animatic of is also made as a piece of concept art. So that's a whole other area that, that I'm not involved in. The, the production designer and the concept artists work up every every shot and really Wes's process is he's a, I always think of him as an additive director you know he's constantly adding detail all the way through the process you know I believe right into editing and post-production he's uh, constantly adding these details in so as a storyboarder you do what you can and you try and contribute but um, it's certainly fun okay thank you and we have another question Anybody have something? I feel one coming up over here. Yes. Well, yeah, I forgot about the, mi the throwing the microphone around. Yeah. Yes, yes. Hi, Nikki. Hi. Um, sorry, I, I just noticed that during your, what do you call it, um, yeah, uh, making, mm -hmm that as if like I didn't see that you use screws for your puppets. Screws, yes. You, you did. Oh, I, uh, because I didn't, because the camera was on top. Yeah. It, seem, it seems that there's no holes or something I was wondering. No, exactly. I mean, I, um, I, s sometimes I'm, I, I use rigs like from above, but, but usually I make, I, I just make like tiny or like have just tiny screws. And I think, like when it's on top, I guess I just sort of try to like remove the, these sort of holes a little bit. Uh, but also, I think you become very aware when you start working with this that if it's not like from above, if it's just like sort of, you know, human uh, perspective, then you don't really see the holes at all. And my holes are quite like tiny as well. So it's, it's easier than you think to sort of hide that out. <laughs> oh. And um, um, how challenging is it? Uh, it is, is it uh, when you animate like I don't know ten puppets? In, mm -hmm. in, um, especially during the dances. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, I sort of uh, I sort of learned that because like when when I worked with Bathhouse, I had. Uh, then I still, like, I, I, I try not to animate too much myself these days because I feel that there are people that are much better to do that than me. Uh, but, like, in the days of Bathhouse, I, I had, an, like, an extra uh, animator to work with me on, like, a couple of scenes where there are, like, you know, seven or eight characters at the same time. But then, like, for example, when we worked with The Burden, uh, I just sort of realized that you don't gain that much from, from B. I mean, it, like at least in my position because I don't have like several uh, computers and several uh, you know um, what's it called like um, uh, screen uh, screening yeah you can't you can't really see uh, uh, like if, if we were two or three people you would need to sort of like gather through the same like around the same computer anyway so that just takes so much time so it was like it's actually much easier for like just one person to sort of like keep, in, keep track of nine uh, characters, which seems like an impossible thing, but it's actually, since everything is 
so slow. It's uh, it's actually doable. I, I completely um, agree with what mm. you're saying. In my experience, um, you know, working with Ottoman animations in the past, mm. I was blown away by you know I don't know if you guys have seen Wallace and Gromit, Curse mm. of the Were Rabbit, and there's certain scenes that are set in a church, you know, mm. with all these people in the pews and the vicar and mm. the, and it, you know it was one animator that yeah. they just left alone. You know, in the unit, and don't disturb me. Yeah. Uh, don't don't distract me because you know I'm thinking about all these different characters. Uh, it's it's fascinating. Yeah, but, what they yeah do. exactly. And there's time to do that. You know, it's still like you, you can just like focus on one character each, and like what what was I doing here, and like next what was. So I think, yeah, I think you don't gain that much from being too many in the same shoot. Funny enough. Hmm. Uh, another question here. Yeah. I was wondering about um, like if you storyboard so so much, like how much is the editing afterwards? Like with stop motion, I can imagine that you don't edit anyway that much afterwards. Uh, but like with the uh, fiction films also uh, that you worked on, is the editing then also much less intensive, or is there still a lot of freedom during the shooting? I think um, you would agree in stop motion. That's the whole point of doing the storyboarding, isn't yeah. it? To really limit. Yeah. Um, wastage. Mm -hmm. um, so, from a stop motion point of view, uh, you know, Isle of Dogs. Certainly, there were many. Ver you know, there were versions of scenes that were tried that weren't, you know, weren't correct. Um, the sequences that were in the animatic that are in the final thing. So, it, from that point of view, it's a, a time-saving, money-saving tool, certainly. Um, but you spoke to live action. I'm not sure. Um, my experience of working in live action is often they'll special use they'll storyboard special effects scenes or stunt scenes. Um, but speaking to Wes's process on Grand Budapest and French Dispatch, I don't think there would have been much need to edit, get rid of shots because um, he's gone through this process. It feels so like it's quite controlled in like ev even in the live action movies that it's like very precise everything and. Yeah, I think he's still tinkering. I, in post production, as most directors do, they're mm. able to still, you know, change shots, mm. flop things around. So I, 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 I think some of that is going on, but certainly um, the French Dispatch animatic was quite tight. Mm. You know, it was it was quite um, organized, and the timings were were there. So um, I don't think too much ended up in the editing bin. All right, we have time for, I think, one last question because I also want to leave time so that you guys can come down, say hello, take a selfie with the puppets. Uh, so if there's one more burning question, um, there we go. Oh, there's two. Maybe we have time for two. Okay, just down the line here. Hey, I have a question for Nikki about your music. I mean, your music is a very integral part. I just wanted to know how involved you are to sing a song and then the composer takes it, or how do you collaborate? <laughs> yes, all the time. It's like, <laughs> la, no, but, but, it's, <laughs> but it's much more, um, uh, well, actually, it's quite interesting because, like, my first two films, I was, like, very, very, um, I was sort of, like, almost scared to use music. Like, in Bathhouse, I, I used no music, and Tor and Tor, I used very little because I, I'm a little bit allergic to music in films that are not really, like, I mean, they're just like too much. There's like sort of forcing the audience uh, to to feel a certain feeling uh, that could, like, like all. It, it feels just a bit like clumsy uh, a lot of times. So so I, I wanted to avoid that. But in um, in the burden, I tried instead to just like go in the other direction and just like go all in with the music. Uh, and then I worked with Hans Appelqvist. Uh, he's a Swedish artist and musician, and he. <laughs> it's quite fun because his own music is very like quirky and like arty and uh, I like forced him into like yeah make like I, I like gave him some clips like make like West Side Story make like uh, you know this this Gene Kelly movie or whatever so so and he was just like oh, okay and and he, he did his best and it became like so great uh, and also in um, well actually in um, uh, the uh, something to remember I uh, I started making that film like literally the day after I'd been on maternity leave for six months. So I was just like, I need to do, like, due to some reasons, I need to sort of start right away and sort of like just 
get into it uh, uh, like the first hour and I was just like yeah so this uh, so this this is actually like a lullaby uh, like from the 30s not not with this uh, uh, lyrics obviously but but with, it's like a very old Swedish lullaby so uh, Hans sort of uh, did another arrangement for it uh, and also Martin Luke who's a Swedish comedian uh, helped me to write this sort of like more poetic uh, lyrics so uh, I just felt like I just feel really connected to me. I, I love music. It's just that I like if there's supposed to be music, I want to sort of make it make it uh, like a, a very important part of the film. Otherwise, it's no use at all. Thank you. Okay, one one last question over here to your right Ooh. there. <laughs> okay, here. Hi, uh, the question is for Nikki. And the thing is, I um, want to know um, how many, if you make an animatic, mm. one question is, if, mm. you make, if you do that before to begin to shoot. Mm. And the other question, how many freedom you give in these scenes, maybe you don't have clear in your mind. And in, if you are shooting, uh, mm. how many freedom you give in the shooting process or in the animation? Uh, yeah, I do animatics for sure, but not this, uh, not this detailed, uh, which I look forward to do because it's, it really feels that it's a, a matter of like, yeah, I think this will be good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I think this movement should work, I'm not sure, so I, I mainly have like maybe just like one or two images for one scene, so it's, but, but it's very much a matter of just like sort of do some sort of rough timing, uh, so yes, uh, but, and also... I don't know. I mean, like sometimes when I work, I, I work with quite a few animators that I that I come back to, and and like we get to know each other. And of course, sometimes it's like you you they come up with something like yeah, maybe he could sort of, you know, touch that or like scratch his head or whatever. Like so, that could definitely come from an animator. Or but usually I'm like around uh, the animation and also like while watching what has been done, you sort of come up with things as well. So that's, that's a very nice way of working actually, because like, or, and also of course you need to keep the balance so that you can actually also move forward and not like sort of lose yourself in directing each frame because that can also happen, I think, just that you never get finished. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that, that wraps our time up, but just to put your hands together to thank our wonderful Nikki and Jay. Thanks guys. Yeah, so, so do come down, do come say hello.